Hello and welcome everybody to the first episode about how to use Spring Boot with Spring Data Neo4j to connect to a Neo4j instance. It's a really great time right now to check out those technologies because they all just got out new releases. So we have Spring Boot 2.4, Spring Data Neo4j 6.0 that is available when you choose Spring Boot 2.4 and the latest release of Neo4j, Neo4j 4.2. Because this is a lot to talk about, I decided to split this up into multiple episodes. So this episode will be about how to set up a Neo4j instance, how to populate data, and how to connect to it with a simple Java application. In the upcoming episode, we will add Spring Boot to the mix. As I already mentioned, it brings support for the latest Spring Data Neo4j 6.0. But not only this, you will also get auto configuration support for the war Java driver. We will talk about how to set up a driver instance and use it directly or get it provided for the usage of Spring Data Neo4j. Talking about Spring Data Neo4j, we will also have a look how to work with repositories and access your domain. For this to work, we will speak about how to set up an example domain to work with. In the third episode, episode 2, we will talk about the different layers of abstractions to access a Neo4j instance and interact with it. So there is more than just the raw driver access or the domain-driven design focus Neo4j repositories. In episode 3, the fourth episode, we will have a look at the reactive data access, how to use the pure Java driver or Spring Data Neo4j in a reactive fashion. We will also have an eye on how to test those applications. I hope you will have fun and join me on this journey. I will have. Let us now talk about how to get a running instance of Neo4j, either on your very local machine or get an instance in the cloud. The first option I want to present you is the Neo4j desktop. If you have no experience in using Neo4j, this might be the right choice for you. Just head over to neo4j.com and click the Neo4j desktop. After extracting it, the application will present you with more or less nothing, because the Neo4j desktop itself does not come with a Neo4j instance. If you create a new project, you can then choose which database version you want to download and then create it. Also, it gives you the opportunity to install additional plugins for this whole video tutorial series, we do not need this. The second option is to use the Neo4j standalone server. You can also download it directly from the Neo4j homepage and extract it anywhere you need it. You can also use it, for example, on a system where no UI is available. The third option is our official Docker image. So if you do not need to set up a lot of parameters, you can just opt in for the Docker image and use it anywhere you need it. The next options are those options I would call the cloud options. On the Neo4j homepage, you can create your very own instance of a sandbox. A sandbox is a limited time instance running for you in the cloud. You can either choose from an empty data set or have pre-populated data in there. There are several use cases you can choose from if you want to play around with the data. The second option in those cloud options is an Aura instance. Aura is our official cloud hosting solution for you. So after setting up a Neo4j instance in the flavor you prefer, it is now time to populate it with data. Luckily for us, Neo4j comes with a so-called movie graph. It is not populated within your database upfront, but you can manually create it. So we will just call the play movies example and choose the query for the data creation and execute it. This is the dataset we will use throughout all the episodes and for every example we will see. And now let's connect to a Neo4j database. With every installation, there comes the Neo4j browser and the Cypher shell with it. As you have already seen, I've used the Neo4j browser to connect to a Neo4j instance. If you choose to use the console, there is Cypher shell available for you with every Neo4j installation. But we want to write an application. Let's dig into the code and connect the Java driver with a Neo4j instance. 
To create a minimal example, I choose to create a Maven skeleton for this project. So the only dependency we have to declare here is the latest Neo4j driver. We can then create the database connection. So we go in here and create a Neo4j driver instance. So we will connect on our local machine to the default bolt port and provide the needed authentication. So we take the auth tokens helper class and we choose the basic authentication with our default password. The driver itself is auto-closable, so you could use it in a driver's resources block, but this would lead to a try cascade because also our, the driver session is auto-closable. I go ahead and use this for the session, so you know what I mean with auto-closable if you're not so familiar with this feature. So every driver gives us the possibility to create a session. In our example for now, we use the imperative session. The driver itself also supports asynchronous sessions and reactive sessions. So let's stick to this one. What's important about closing and auto-closable is that the connection or the connection pool, to be more precise, will keep open until somebody calls explicitly the close method. So we do this here for the driver now to ensure that our application will also terminate. So now we have two choices to interact with the database. We could either use an explicit transaction or make use of the transaction, transaction functions. Those transaction functions give me a handle to the transaction I can work with. And I am also make sure by deciding to opt in for a retransaction or a write transaction that in case of a retransaction, no write operation will get executed on the database, but will return me an exception. We just want to read data for this minimalistic example. So I choose the read transaction. With this transaction object, I can then run the query. Like I said, we will use the example movie data set. So we can query, for example, for all the movies and then just return the title of every movie. What's now important is that if we would return this result, we would still have a handle on the internal references to the records we get returned. You should not bypass the boundaries of a transaction with these internal objects. It's very important because it can lead to memory leaks or similar. That's why we then collect all the returned entities or better, we stream them first, then map to a nicer structure. In this example, I will get for every row the database returns or for every node it finds a record. I would, recur um, I would return the records and then look for the column or property how you view is on the data um, movie title. And I say, I'm pretty sure this will be a string. So accessing the record and then looking into the returned record for the property movie title 
will return me the exact thing I want to have. And then in the end, I can collect everything into a list. So we return this. Strings. And we need to import some of those classes. And now I at least assume that in my result set or result list are all the movies from the database. So let's output all the movies. We run the application now and we will see errors. Why is it so? Oh yeah, we forgot to start the instance. So let's head over to a terminal. As I presented you before, we have several flavors of running Neo4j. I use the most practical one for this example and the one I use for my local machines most of the time. It's to use the Docker image. So we do a Docker one and I want to expose the ports for our web interface, the Neo4j browser. And of course, I need the bolt port to connect our application to this. Then I have also the possibility to set my initial credentials right through the environment. It might be not the most secure solution, but it will work for our small example here and for your test drives or similar. Then nothing left to say. Then please download the latest for the two image and give it a go. Luckily on my machine, I already downloaded it. It will then in a sudden boot up and be available. So now after the application has started, we can look into the browser. And here we can connect to the database providing the authentication parameters we just set for the Docker image to start and then connect to our instance. As you've seen in the introduction, we use the play movies command to create data. So the first page here is an introduction with additional features of the database. But on the second page, you find the most important thing, the query that will populate our empty Neo4j da uh, database with the movie data set. So clicking on this will bring the query into the input field and then I can execute it. The data gets populated to the database and we can then return to our application. Without any changes here, we can just start the application again and we will see all the titles of the movies that exist in the database. Having said this, this is the minimalistic example how to connect to the database. I hope you had a little bit of fun and learned something today. Next time we will have a look on how to bring Spring Boot into the mix and work with Spring Data Neo4j. Thanks for watching and bye.